We should tell of military growth on Salisbury Plain, expansion of the camping grounds at Bulford, Luggershall and Tedworth Mansion, how Lark Hill and Netheravon nursed the Bristol biplane skyward, circling old Stonehenge, of wondrous novelty were both a byword. Now, in the year 1898, when the vast girt military manoeuvres had taken place, and which I told you a little about in a previous film, the war office started by an upper states on and about Salisbury Plain, making a series of huge investments all over. That year they bought 3,000 acres at Bulford, building rifle ranges and a large hutted camp, later replaced in brick. In 1906 the Ainsbury Light Military Railway were extended through the parish and Bulford become home for the Royal Artillery for the next 70 years. Up the hill at Durrington land were bought and a camp established there which would expand at Lark Hill and Fargo in the Girt War to follow. The manor at Tidworth were bought in 1897 for a garrison connected to Southern Area Command, Tedworth House becoming the commanding officer's residence. An isolation hospital would be built, new barracks at Lucknow and Mool Tan in 1905, extending on to Brimstone Bottom and Perham Down. Vic were helped by the extension of the railway from the Marlborough to Andover, which passed through nearby Luggershall. Thick Little Market Town had been bought too, and the Little Railway Station there saw a fourfold increase in traffic, some 14,000 persons using Thick Station in just three months in 1901, while navvies were building the camps, many of these new folks spending their spare time both in the villages of Luggershall and at the Ram Inn at Tidworth. But it weren't just the Harmy that were moving in, for at Netheraven nearly 8,000 acres were bought, initially for a cavalry school, where there were an indoor riding school built, and later hangars for an airfield, building on the work at nearby Uphaven, where 800 acres had been bought for an army firing range, and another 425 for an airfield of the Central Flying School, opened there in 1912. The advance of aeronautics were a miracle. Samuel Cody made the first controlled flight in the country at Farnborough in 1908, and within months of that, one Horatio Barber turned up on Durrington Down to build a shed that would house his own design of aeroplane, with which he experimented. Shortly afterwards, G. B. Coburn erected his own shed on Lark Hill, where he brought his Henry Farman biplane. Coburn spent his time away from year, training Navy men in flying at Eastchurch, but three of these men would become the first instructors of the Central Flying School at Uphaven after 1911. In June 1910, the British and Colonial Aeroplane Company moved to Lark Hill to open their flying school. An air battalion of the British Army were instigated in April 1911, with two parts, the Lighter Than Air Works at Farnborough and the Aeroplane Department based at Lark Hill. They little sheds there at Lark Hill are indeed the oldest surviving aerodrome structures in the country. Sheds they had, but not planes, since there were so few military men capable of flying one that there were a reluctance to part with the monies required to provide the actual planes. And two, what planes! By our ideas of modern small aircraft, these things were out of the ark! Cloth and board things held together with bits of wire and string, run on elastic bands it seemed. They had a Blario Type 12 and a couple of box kites flown during the military manoeuvres on the plane in 1910, but the Vus 2 Bristol box kites arrived in May 1911, followed by a variety of different planes, including a Newport monoplane, a Paulham and a Bregway biplane. But the Harmy wanted the best, and there weren't yet any standard technology on aircraft design and aerodynamics, so in August of 1912 were held the military trials at Lark Hill. After that, changes and expansion continued until the coming of war in 1914 helped make important decisions and pushed thick new technology into necessitous improvement. By thick time, important work was ongoing both at Brooklands and Farnborough, as well as at Lark Hill, Uphaven and Netheraven. 
Aeroplanes were a wondrous novelty, a wonder of the age, and people regularly come up and crowded round the tin huts at Lark Hill to watch the take-off and landings of a flimsy craft. But there were another wondrous novelty near Lark Hill too, one folk had wondered about for hundreds of years, and that were the old Stonehenge. For years folk had often thought of having a picnic up at the stones, driving their old dobbin with the cart up there with a bag and nammet, a tablecloth to eat it off, and a fiddle or accordion to pass the time. In course everyone tried to count the stones, and twere natural enough, no two folks could count them the same. Ah, I recalls being up at Wald Stonehenge and seeing a girt shower we a marvellous rainbow and a girt flock of lapwings shimmering below it. It is a wondrous novelty, that old temple, but no more strange than the world ever moving about it.